my name is Jackie Decker, and we're going to dig into how we can use the five practices to support student learning during problem solving like a three-act math task. The other video focuses on the three-act math task. This one will focus more on anticipating, monitoring, and consolidating learning from student thinking. Where do the five practices come from? This is a book by Margaret Smith and Mary Kay Stein called The Five Practices for Orchestrating Productive Mathematics Discussions. And those five practices are anticipating, monitoring, selecting, sequencing, and connecting. Though we also know to make them really effective, we need practice zero, which is intentional planning, and practice six, planning next steps. We're gonna go through each of these in sequence. So practice zero, intentional planning. It's really important to support student learning that our task connects to not only the curriculum expectations for our students, but where they actually are right now in their learning. We looked at the three act math task called Geared Up by Graham Fletcher. If you wanna know more about how to facilitate a three act math task, check out the other video. I just wanna remind you of the problem that students are going to be solving here. Students, in this case the participants in a workshop, were shown this video by Graham Fletcher as Act 1 of his three-act math task called Geared Up. They were asked to notice and wonder what was happening in the video. We agreed on this problem. How many times do we need to turn that small gear for all the dots to line up again? And this is all the information that was given to students. When you do a task, any task, three act math task or otherwise, it's really important that we pause to anticipate what the different strategies are gonna be that our students will use to solve the problem. Thinking about two things. What's the mathematical thinking that's gonna come out and which different representations might students use? You wanna take the time to write these down. This will make Number two, a lot easier. We're gonna monitor what our students are doing as they solve this problem. The easiest way to do this is to just stop talking and observe and listen to your students. This is easiest if your students are standing at vertical non-permanent surfaces around your classroom. Once you've watched your students solve those problems, you're thinking about which of these solutions am I gonna to present to the class? You're selecting some of them and then you're gonna sequence. You're gonna think about what order you're gonna present those in. And we really need to have done some purposeful planning here because you're thinking about what are the mathematical big ideas I want students to take away from this and how am I gonna sequence the solutions to get to the mathematical thinking I want to bring out. So I'm gonna show you some solutions and I want you to pause the video and think about which of the solutions you would select and how you might sequence them to build understanding for all of your students. When you're thinking about this, you also need to think about practice five, which is connecting those solutions. We want the ideas in all of the solutions to be connected for students, and that's how we're actually gonna uncover the curriculum expectations so that students can make connections between the representations and the math thinking. This comes as we notice and name their thinking and connect them clearly. This is how I might have done this. I've chosen two solutions that are really looking at the idea of multiple. So on the left here, we have students who are skip counting to find those multiples. So in the small gear, they said at the beginning there were zero. After one turn, eight teeth, 16 teeth, 24, 32, 40, and 48, and they've come to this number. In the medium gear, we started at zero. One turn gave us 16 teeth, 32, 48. So we've got skip counting that's using repeated addition to get at that multiplication to find a common multiple. And in, case, in this case, the lowest common multiple. The group over here has done the same thing. They've got the small gear here, the medium gear here, and the large gear here. Again, they're using repeated addition down the columns to find the lowest common multiple. Some other groups used ratios, fractions, and proportional reasoning to explore this problem. This group started with a ratio of the teeth. The small gear had eight teeth, the largest one had 24, and the medium one had 16, and they simplified that ratio to one, to three, to two. They changed that into a ratio of the rotations. When the smallest gear had gone through a full rotation, the largest one had only gone through a third of a rotation, and the medium one a half of a rotation. 
other groups took that thinking further and said, well, if our ratio is one to one half to one third, so we've moved that thinking to a different orientation now, and they scaled that up. When the small gear had two rotations, we had one rotation and two thirds of a rotation. Three rotations of the small one, we had one and a half and one, and they kept growing that proportionally until we had a whole number of rotations in each of those. We see the same thinking in this final group comparing the small, the medium, and the large gear, but they're showing it differently. We're showing in terms of eighths, sixteenths, and twenty-fourths, which are unsimplified ratios and fractions that are clearly related to the simplified fractions down here. So all of these groups are really using proportional reasoning, using ratios and fractions. Practice number six is using all this information to plan some next steps. So we wanna further the learning. You might need to intentionally choose some tasks that students are gonna work on next, or you might need to do things in other parts of your program. Maybe you're gonna teach a mini lesson, maybe you're going to incorporate other activities. If we want our students to move from additive thinking to multiplicative thinking, there are a few different learning strategies that are gonna help here. Doing number talks about multiplication and using manipulatives to work on different models of multiplication. Let me show you where to find resources about that. For more information about number talks, you're gonna go into the elementary segment of our Minds Online space, and you're gonna to go to number talks. There are all sorts of resources in there that are gonna help you out. If you're interested in more about models of multiplication, we're gonna scroll down a little more and we're going to go into number sense and numeration. And then we're going to look at fluency and flexibility. And there is a presentation about fluency junior intermediate, which includes models of multiplication. And so that's gonna help you there. If you'd like to give students a nudge towards proportional reasoning, a good three act task to follow up with this one is the classic lemonade problem. To find the three-act task, the lemonade problem, you're gonna go into the secondary unit and you're going to go into the three-act task folder here and you'll find the lemonade problem down at the bottom. Only act one is here, you might have to act out act three for yourself. In summary, here's a great sketch note that shows the five practices from the book by Smith, Hughes, Engel, and Stein made by Laura Wheeler, an educator in Ottawa. Thanks so much for listening.